When we were x-raying the table cabinet, Nick and I were sitting together in the x-ray room and we had the plate that was being scanned to reveal the image on the monitor. And all of a sudden we saw the x-ray pop on to the screen of the lid. And the first thing Nick and I realized instantaneously was that there was a big skeleton in the center of the image that neither of us, you know, had ever seen on the table cabinet because it's not visible. So this is a table cabinet made around 1650 in what was then known as the Viceroyalty of Peru, an area that's now a part of Colombia, overlapping with areas of Peru and Ecuador. It's essentially portable and would have been used for storing writing equipment. This object is filled with all sorts of motifs. We have some wonderful depictions of the nature in the area, we think. We have monkeys playing guitars. We've got birds. In the top here, it looks like we've got a hunting dog with a bird um, in its mouth. We've got some incredible insects that are also represented. The more you look at this object, um, the more you, you start to see so this table cabinet is decorated with a material known as Mopa Mopa. And Mopa Mopa is a natural plant resin from a tree that grows at a high altitude in the Andes mountain region. And this resin is taken from the end of a branch where new leaves are developing. And the Mopa Mopa resin is sort of a coating that protects this new growth. And then this material is collected and it's put in boiling water. It becomes a bit plastic, a bit like chewing gum. And in fact, they take the material and put it in their mouth while it's hot and remove impurities that we can see here. So we can see that there's plant material. And then they get to this sort of stage where it's nice and smooth. And you can see this is beautiful and shiny. The Mopa Mopa would then be stretched, would be cut out to the design that we see on the table cabinet and would have been placed on top of a ground, a base layer of Mopa Mopa and then pressed into position. When the artists use it to make a decorative object, the technique using Mopa Mopa is known as Barnese de Pasto. What was very exciting was when we acquired this in 2015, this was the first known example of Barney's de Pasto in a UK public institution. It's been enormously gratifying to develop our contacts with Colombian curators and museums and to receive their approval and congratulations on acquiring the piece and being able to draw attention to the marvels of the Barnes de Pasto technique to new audiences in London. On the front of the box, we've got a sea monster with torrents of water gushing from his body. And this one is surrounded by a Latin text that means storms surround me on all sides. There is an interesting question for us as to whether that represents a typical European sea monster or whether in the mind of the maker and some of its viewers, it might also evoke an Andean water deity, the Amaru, which is very similar in many respects. On the back of the cabinet, in what is perhaps the best preserved of the scenes, 
we have what represents the pelican in her piety, as it's known, a traditional Christian motif. We knew that it was a first uh, for the museum and we wanted to find out as much as possible about it. And we have techniques here in the science section at the VNA that can really look under the skin of our objects and discover what is not necessarily visible to the naked eye. We agreed on a plan, you know, what type of scientific analysis I was going to do, what were the questions, what kind of answers we were expecting. And then almost from day one, we stumbled upon discovery after discovery after discovery. Instead of finding relatively normal pigments like lead white or chalk, I found mercury chloride. Mercury chloride is known as a medicine but to our knowledge, it had never been used as a pigment. So that was a big first and something that we really wanted to investigate further. So the overall condition of the box of what we see here, right now you're seeing an object that's in mid-treatment. And we have, you know, objects that are this old typically don't survive without having had some alterations or repairs or interventions of some kind. And we certainly see that here in this box because we've got various signs of damage and repair, as well as the varnish that was on the surface. We have um, two different types of overpainting that we've also found. So one is a acrylic overpaint, but we also have evidence that we have oil overpaint and that this overpaint is occurring in areas where we have loss and damage of the Mopa Mopa. The routine analysis of the surface layer of paint revealed that most materials used there were 20th century. I found titanium white, which was commercially available effectively from the 1920s. And then I found another pigment, which was only invented is in 1958. In studying a piece of furniture and cataloguing it in detail, one of the things I'm interested in is to understand exactly how it's been made. So one of the techniques we have to do that is looking at the piece through an x-ray which will highlight the presence of any metalwork, particularly nails that are holding it together. But what the x-ray also showed, to our enormous surprise, was a design with a standing skeleton that we couldn't see with the naked eye. A moment of initial confusion, shock, and then some excitement because we realised it must be there underneath the visible surface. We used microcomputer tomography and we used XRF mapping. XRF stands for X-ray fluorescence. This is a combination of three elemental maps obtained with XRF mapping. You have in red all the spots that contain mercury then in green you have everything that contains lead and you can see that some of the repairs and the restoration has been made with lead white and then in blue you can see all the areas that contain calcium and in this case calcium has been used as a filler to fill in cracks or nail or screw holes or areas that needed some filling because the surface was damaged in some way. We had discovered that there was acrylic paint on the inside of the lid through microscopy that Lucia carried out, but we had thought that the acrylic paint had been put on to embellish the surface. You know, we thought that maybe it was rather plain on the inside of the lid, but in fact, what we learned from this X-ray was there was a lot of decoration that was being masked and hidden by this acrylic paint. Very excitingly, while the x-rays show us the inorganic elements that are present on the box, like mercury or lead, there are about half of the designs that are made of organic materials that are dyes um, that are created from trees or plants or insects that aren't detectable when an x-ray is done. So we have an idea about half of the designs that would be hidden by the acrylic, but the other half, we don't know what is going to be there. 
So now we come to the underside of the lid, which, as we know, is completely overpainted with mid 20th century paint. What we can see very clearly is the standing figure of death, a skeleton holding a scythe and a bow and arrows. And we can be confident that that has been adapted from this 1613 print by Matthias Merian, published in Paris. He specialised in memento mori images of death in all kinds of inventive positions. In the 17th century context, the skeleton of death is not so unusual. It's part of a tradition, a long Christian tradition known as the memento mori, remember that you have to die. So why would somebody have overpainted it? Two possibilities spring to mind. One is that the underside was extremely badly damaged and covering it over completely was simpler than trying to reconstruct the scheme that was there previously in order to make it more attractive and perhaps more saleable. The alternative hypothesis in my mind is that the scheme with its very bold, even macabre scene of the skeleton of death with his weapons was not to the liking of the owner. Well, this is pretty exciting. Oh, it's really exciting. Would you imagine that these, these big blank areas, they must have something in there? I think so. I mean, based on the density of the designs everywhere else on the box, I'd imagine that everywhere we have the lack of design visible in the CT scan, that there'll be something there. And it's, you can't really imagine that they'd leave a, a border like this blank when they've filled all the others so scrupulously. I mean, that's what I'm expecting. I'm hopeful that we might find more text here, but the X-ray highlighted lettering, didn't mm. it? So the lack of those traces maybe means that we're not going to get lettering on the underside of the lid. It may be that we don't have any, but you know, when we look, say, for example, on the top of the lid, the Latin inscription in the white we know is that mercury chloride pigment that would be picked up. So if they chose to do it in a different colour, right. and if that colour is organic, then it's possible that we'll see it when we take the paint off. But it's also possible there's nothing there. I'm quite keen to see if these um, little raccoons or armadillos are doing something more interesting that we can't make out at the moment. Removing the overpaint on the underside of the lid will be wonderful because we will see the full extent of the detail that's there. But for me, there's a, a bigger gain to it as well in that we already know this piece has one of the most complex iconographic schemes for any Banis de Pasto made in the 17th century. But at the moment, we're missing the final ingredient in that story. Lifting up the lid is the last reveal. I'm optimistic that what we'll find there will help make sense of all the other scenes that we can see. The fact that I can identify materials on the object provides information to conservators, or in this case to Dana, to choose what kind of materials to use for her cleaning or consolidation processes. So now I'm about to remove the acrylic overpaint. In preparation for that, I've done some experimentation to see how best to do that with having the most minimal impact on the object and the original materials. Because of course, if I was going to remove the acrylic and if it was damaging to the original materials, we wouldn't be able to do it. With some solvent, the acrylic came up beautifully. So what I'm anticipating is a fairly straightforward procedure and of course famous last words. Hopefully it will all go according to plan, but it will be a process of using solvent rolled gently onto the surface to just remove that top layer that is obscuring the surface below. Repairs and restorations are generally to be expected on furniture because it's used and things get worn out. Now in this case, we, as always, think very carefully about removing a large area. It's stable, it's not doing any harm, and one might say this 20th century scheme is also an important part of the object's history. But in this case, there are two 
critical bits of information for us to base our planning on. We know from the advanced scanning that we have a very largely intact original scheme underneath this piece. And secondly, we know from the dating of some of the colours used in the overpainting that this was an extremely late addition in terms of its history. Since starting uh, on the removal of the overpaint, I've changed tack slightly and I've needed to adapt based on how the paint removal was progressing. And what I found was that the free solvent on the swab that worked really well for my test area didn't work as well in practice for larger areas. So I made a solvent gel to extend the contact time of the solvent with that later non-original paint, and that's worked brilliantly. By using the microscope, I'm able to see the surface in detail and to also make sure that any vulnerable areas are protected and that I'm not doing anything unintentional to the surface and it's as safe as possible. So I've just started on the central panel, my first pass, and letters are appearing. Ah, exciting. Yeah. And lettering could really help explain the death figure and the emblematic meaning of it. So we have an ES, a CON, yep. and then this EN. And then we can just see the tail of that little kind of raccoon kind of creature appearing from underneath the border murk, aren't we? Yes, we can. We knew that there was something that looked like a guinea pig, but we never thought that it would be this kind of pale violet or mauve colour. And that prompts more questions like, how do we make sure that this colour that is now revealed in all its glory can remain without fading under the light, for example? How do we protect it? How do we make sure that people can see it? decades from now, because at the end of the day, that's where we're here. Dana, this is incredible to see. Are we looking at the original scheme here, or is there quite a bit missing, or some of it still potentially covered over with overpainting of a different period. I think we're looking at a lot of the original scheme. It's different than what I was expecting. I thought maybe we were going to get something like we see on the other areas of the box that was immediately legible and understandable. So the fact that we have these, these letters, um, but it's not immediately <laughs> clear what's being communicated in this scene. So, you know, at first glance, of course, you think, well, what, is the, what does the lettering mean? It appears to be in Spanish rather than the Latin. S is la, the, con, with, e, and, n, in. But on the face of it, that doesn't give us a straightforward motto. So another possibility is that the scene is intended to be read as a combination of lettering and words and images in what's often called a rebus, a puzzle, so that you combine them and end up with a message. I'm really struck at how linear the imagery is. It, it really is in line with the lettering that we've uncovered. It, it feels screen. like there's a deliberate statement mm. to be interpreted there, doesn't it? It does. You've gone beyond the general evocations of moral fortitude or vigilance, and here's the core message. It's just that I can't read it at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've, we've uncovered one bit of the mystery, literally, and, and here we, we have more work to do. Yeah, and we were expecting a death scene, and in fact it's, it's full of life. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is. Okay, now over to you to um, crack this code. <laughs>